So let's read Matthew 19, beginning in verse 3. The Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus intends for married people to stay married. What God has joined together, he says, let not man separate. But it is my observation that people who get married don't go into a marriage expecting to get divorced. They go into a marriage expecting to be married for life. So what happens? Why is it that divorce is so prominent? And it's prominent among people in the world who don't go into marriage expecting to get divorced. And it's also prominent among people who are familiar with Jesus' teaching, Christians, who go into a marriage knowing that God expects us to be married for life. What God has joined together, let not man separate. And the issue is not that Christians don't know, that we're not familiar with the teaching of Jesus. The issue is that there reaches a point where we become so miserable in our marriages, so frustrated, so upset, so worn down, that maybe just for a little while, it seems like divorce may be a good option. Like maybe divorce, even though Jesus forbade it, maybe that really would be best for me. Maybe this situation isn't really what Jesus had in mind. So, while we need to emphasize that Jesus teaches us not to divorce, it seems to me that we also need to focus our attention on how we can avoid reaching the point where that sounds like a good option to us. And that's what I want to do for a few minutes this afternoon. I want to talk about divorce prevention. Divorce is an awful thing, and that is a universal truth. That's not something that is peculiarly Christian to observe. If you were to talk to anyone, whether they believe in God or not, have any interest in God or not, they would say, yes, divorce is bad. Divorce is bad demographically. Divorce is bad in what it does to kids. Divorce is bad in what it does to people. Divorce is bad financially. Divorce is bad. So the question is, can we do something about it to prevent it, not just by teaching more about how bad it is, but by working on marriages so that we don't reach that point? That's what I want to do for a few minutes this afternoon. I want to talk first sort of a preliminary thing. I want to talk first about some pre-marriage discussion. And the question for those who are not yet married, I suspect that we have those in our audience who may be engaged, considering marriage, those who probably hope to be married before too long. And the question I want to propose that is the controlling question when you are in that state is the question, are we both all in? Look at Matthew 19 and verse 6 again. Matthew 19 and verse 6, it says, So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So the idea is, if God joins us together, we are going to be together and we're not going to separate. I am going to be married to you for the rest of our lives. And so the question, if you are not yet married, is, I want to know if that's the way I feel about this person. And I want to know, particularly important to me, is that the way they feel about me? Are we both all in on marriage? The Bible teaches that marriage is a covenant. A covenant is a solemn promise that I will do certain things. Now, you will do certain things, but I am promising, I am laying my word out there that this is what I will do and where I will be. So, Malachi chapter 2 and verse 14 talks about marriage as a covenant. It says, Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. You promised her certain things. You made a covenant with her, and now you have been faithless. You have broken your word. Of course, Malachi is criticizing that for that. Proverbs 2 and verse 16 says, For you will be delivered from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth, speaking of marriage, forsakes the companion of her youth, and forgets the covenant of her God. She made a promise before God to be a companion to a man, and now she has forsaken that covenant. She has broken her word. Now, there is an exception to the idea of that permanent marriage bond. Matthew 19 and verse 9 describes that exception, the idea of fornication in a marriage. But short of that, short of fornication in a marriage, and perhaps even through fornication in a marriage, we are committing I'm going to be there and keep my word and be married to you 
every day, every minute, from now on, all the time, no matter how I'm feeling, no matter how you treat me, whether I like it or not. In fact, if you think carefully about the marriage vows, I've been doing several weddings lately, doing premarital counseling lately. When you look at the marriage vows, I almost think that the marriage vows were concocted as if every possible awful scenario would be right there on the wedding day. For better or worse, sickness or health. How is it going to look? What's it going to be like? You don't know the answers to those questions, but there will be challenges in your marriage. And before you get married, you need to know I'm all in, she's all in. We are together in this. In one survey, it was reported that those who were going through a divorce, when asked to list the various reasons why the divorce was happening, the highest percentage, 73% in this survey, said the reason they got divorced was a lack of commitment to the marriage. In fact, it's surprising that statistics show that uh, couples that live together before marriage have a higher divorce rate than those who do not. Now, that's not the con conventional wisdom, is it? Conventional wisdom is, well, if you live together before you get married, then you kind of try it out, and then you decide whether you want to get married. But it appears that without the commitment of being all in for life, something is missing. And so divorce happens more commonly because we need that commitment. I recently saw this definition of commitment, and I loved it, and I wrote it down, and I'm going to tell you so you can write it down. Commitment is doing what you said you would do long after the mood in which you said it is gone. I felt a certain way, and so I made a promise. What about when you don't feel that way anymore? That's commitment. So before you get married, just know there will be days when you don't feel the way about that person that you do right now. Are you committed? Are you all in? And I think we need to say something while we're on the topic of pre-marriage. I think we need to say something about spiritual compatibility. I do not believe that the Bible teaches that Christians must marry Christians. However, it seems to me to be supremely foolish to not consider the spiritual dimensions of one of the most important choices you will ever make. When you marry someone, you are bringing into your life the person who will have the most spiritual influence of, on you of anybody else. No one will determine your spiritual temperature like your mate. No one. So you have to ask the question. You have to answer the question. Is this a person who's going to make me better? Is this a person who believes like me? Is this a person who is going to encourage me? Or is this a person who's going to tear down my faith, who's going to draw me away from the Lord, who's going to weaken me? Those are questions for before marriage. So, are we both all in? That's just sort of a preliminary idea. Let's get to the divorce prevention. After the marriage, let's talk about, I want to share three things to try to prevent divorce. The first is this. The first is maintain the spark. Romantic love is the fuel of marriage. It is what keeps marriage strong. It is what keeps marriage enjoyable. It's what makes us want to buy in. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs 5, there's a lot in the Bible about romantic love. In fact, there's so much in the Bible about romantic love that it kind of embarrasses us to read some of it. That's why I'm not going to be reading extensively from Song of Solomon this, this afternoon. But it seems to me as though this is, this is ancient wisdom that is very simple, and yet sometimes we neglect it, and we try to focus instead on the drier parts of marriage, the things that are just about do this and don't do that. When the Bible teaches romantic love is a gift from God that will bless us. Proverbs 5 and verse 15. Proverbs 5, 15, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? So you can see Solomon is using these word pictures like a cistern, fountains, to describe the sexual relationship. And he is saying specifically, don't let your sexual attention just go everywhere. Don't be focused on just everybody. Don't have that kind of spirit where it's streams of water in the streets. 
He says, instead, you need to be focused on your mate. That you need to have her as the focus of your attention. Be intoxicated with her love. Don't be focused on the adulteress, just whoever will be around that would be interested in you. That's not what keeps a marriage strong. Instead, he says, you delight in her. You be intoxicated with her. You keep that spark alive. Now, I, I, I hate that I have to say this because it's so intuitive that it seems silly to say, and yet I must say it. If we want to maintain the spark in our marriage, we have to actually think about our mate, focus on our mate. And that's going to mean a choice where we choose not to focus on other people and things. There is a discernment here, a choice. I choose you over the rest. So that means I choose my wife over other women. It means I choose my wife over pornography. It means I choose her to be the object of my conversation. She'll be the one I want to talk to the most and be with the most. She is my focus. Because I want to keep the spark alive. And that's going to require discernment. That's going to require a choice away from other people and things. But as I focus on my mate, you can see this in this text. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Part of that focus on my mate is to remember what it is I love about my mate. If you ever talk to people whose marriages are struggling, and you ask them, what's going on in your marriage? Usually one will start complaining about the other, and then the other will start complaining about that one, and back and forth they go, and it makes you say, well, wait a minute, how did you guys end up together? It's almost as if, well, is there anything redeeming here? They have forgotten what they love. You know, something made you get married. There were things that you loved, things that you enjoyed doing together, things that you loved about your mate. Focus on those things if you want to maintain the spark. Turn the page to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6 and verse 25, speaking of this immoral woman, it says, Proverbs 6, 25, do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with, with her eyelashes, for the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. Don't even start down the path to her house. Don't even desire her beauty in your heart. That's a bad road. So when we talk about divorce prevention, what we're saying is maintaining the spark is going to begin in my heart. This is not about certain things I do or don't do. It's not just, well, I need to know adultery is wrong. That's certainly true. But if I'm wanting to commit adultery, that's a problem too. So he says, don't even start down that path. Don't even get there because you are so focused on your mate. You want to maintain that spark with her. Paul talks about this when he talks about the sexual relationship between husbands and wives. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3. That's a long reading, but I put it on the board. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So the spark that we're talking about involves the sexual relationship and romantic love. You see it. Paul says, you be sure you don't neglect one another, don't deprive one another. This is part of the fuel for marriage. And I understand sometimes that's embarrassing for us to talk about. And sometimes, you know, we say, well, let's cover our kids' ears because the preacher's talking about this again. Okay, the idea is this is what makes marriages strong. Maintain the spark. And I believe that's what's going on in the book, The Song of Solomon. Is Solomon is infatuated. And he sings about it. Now I understand it's a weird sounding song. But I don't think she thought so. Because there were things that he loved about his bride. And he sang about them. And I think we would do well to follow that example. But we have to be honest, there is something that happens in time 
whether it's just that the novelty of marriage and that relationship wears off, whether it's that life presents new challenges, maybe we just get older, and as we get older, things change for us. But it is hard to maintain that spark. And I want to add a couple of passages to this to show you kind of another element of this. Look in Titus chapter 2 with me. Look in Titus 2. How do we keep that spark in our marriages as we grow older? And as sometimes that spark begins to fade, sort of naturally. Titus 2 and verse 3. It says, Titus 2, 3, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Titus 2 and verse 4, And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So he says older women need to be teachers, and one of the things they need to teach and show the younger women is to love their husbands, and to love their children. The implication here is that this is not natural. It must be taught. Now, that seems weird to us because we say, well, of course we love our husbands and love our children. But Paul is saying, no, they need to be taught what that looks like, how that goes. The implication is that love is work. There will be things you have to do. That it won't be natural, it won't always be something you feel, it will be something you must do anyway. You go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Paul implies that love is sacrifice. It's giving something up. It's offering yourself or something you love for someone you love. Christ loves the church to the degree that he holds nothing back. I love my wife. I can hold nothing back. It's all hers. So, what we've been talking about so far, the spark, that says that love is fun. And it's enjoyable and it's something exciting. But then you read these passages that say, no, love is work. And love is sacrifice. In other words, love is hard. And I believe that what people mean when they say things like, I fell out of love, is that they began to, re- began to realize that love is work and that love is sacrifice. In other words, it stopped being quite so fun. I want to challenge that perspective from 1 Corinthians 13 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want you to think with me about this. I understand in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is contextually talking about a local church and love in a local church. But in 1 Corinthians 13, there are some incredible principles for marriage. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4, he says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So Paul is saying, in essence, if I were to sum up these verses, where it talks about him being patient, being kind, talks about how love doesn't envy or boast, isn't arrogant or rude, what he is saying is that love is not selfish. Love is not about me. And I believe the key to maintaining the spark, the key to making love endure when it's fun and when it's work, when it's fun and when it's sacrifice, is understanding that it's not about me. When I am married, when my focus is on her and meeting her needs and making her happy, well, I grow in love. And when I do that, it makes her love me because she sees I'm all in for her. And so she says, well, I'll go all in for him. But when I am saying, no, I'm not getting what I want. You're not doing this for me. I don't like this. You're talking to me that way. You don't talk to me that way. Suddenly, I'm no longer loving because I'm only being selfish. It's all about me. We maintain the spark when we begin to do again what we naturally did when we were dating, when we were first married. That is, we focus on them, how we can make them happy, how we can please them. We do like Christ loved the church, 
We sacrifice ourselves for one another. And in verse 7 it says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. There is an optimism to that that says love can always change and improve something. Things can get better. We can always make this work. And so I say to those, even those who have been married much longer than I have, there is always the potential to maintain that spark. Because that's what love does. Love never says, oh, I'm just done here. Love never says, I don't have to hope that this will get better. Love is eternally optimistic because love is always focused on others and couples that with faith in God. So, we need to maintain the spark and keep things fresh so that as we grow together over time, we maintain that connection. All right, that's point number one. Don't worry, the next two points are twice as long. (laughs) The second is that we need to communicate. To prevent divorce, love must be expressed in communication. Communication, where we talk to one another. I want you to go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3. There are ways of dealing with one another that will damage a relationship. Paul warns us in Colossians about being bitter or being harsh with our mates. In 1 Peter 3, Peter takes up a similar theme as he talks about the the manner in which we address one another. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. 1 Peter 3 and 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Understand, show honor, he says, as to the weaker vessel. Paul seems to be pushing back against the kind of machoism that must have existed in the first century. I think it still exists, frankly. That is the idea that I'm the man. You're the woman. You do what I want. I've heard Christians express themselves in similar ways. That the wife's job is to do what the husband says. After all, husband's head of the wife. And so there is a machoism that can easily become harshness. Do you see how that's not actually what the Bible teaches? Don't be harsh with your wives, Colossians 3, verse 18. And here, show honor to the wife. Dwell with your wives in an understanding way. Be kind, be careful, be gentle. We have different needs. And what this passage says is that we have a need to learn one another. Show honor to her and live with her in an understanding way. So I'll just tell a little bit about how that has worked in my marriage. I have found that, this may shock you, sometimes my wife tells me what she needs. I don't do that very well, but she will just say it. And and as I prepared this lesson, I thought through, and Sarah and I kind of talked about some of the bigger fights that we, um, disagreements that we've had. I did that last time I preached it, too. Uh, we talked about uh, the... So, I, I, by the way, I cleared all this by her. So, um, The time that we argued about filling up the gas in the car, um, the time about Valentine's Day, you remember that one, and uh, the time about the briefcase. Almost always, it's a small thing, right? It doesn't really matter. But when the the disagreement begins, immediately I get defensive. And so I stop listening. And then she is just sitting there, and as plain as day, she, she could be shouting, she's just telling me exactly what she wants. This is what I need. This is what I'm saying. This is what I need. It's a communication problem. And you know, if if any of you were there sitting there, you would say, Jacob, Jacob, just listen. We struggle to communicate. Very often, our mates are telling us, this is what I need. And we have to listen. Live with your wives in an understanding way and show honor to the wife. So if I'm only focused on myself and what I'm getting, what I need and what I like, then I'm obviously going to have a problem listening to her express what she needs and what she likes. So if men and women are different, And they are. Communication is how those differences are bridged. We talk through. We work through. But we have to be willing to listen. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, 
slow to anger. That is a great, great, great marriage verse. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. As we work through our problems, live with your wives with an understanding way, communicate with each other. In fact, probably the most important element of communication in a marriage is that we need to be able to communicate about conflict in order to resolve it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 for a moment. Matthew 5, when Jesus talks about conflict here, he has a certain spirit with which we approach conflict with one another, and that spirit is hinging on communication. Matthew 5, verse 21. Matthew 5 and verse 21, it says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put into prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Be reconciled to your brother, he says. Be reconciled to your brother. I'm thinking particularly of verse 24. First, be reconciled to your brother. That is going to require communication. In whatever setting we're talking about, whatever the brother here is, if we're going to be reconciled to somebody, we're going to have to talk to them. But there is also poor communication. Did you notice that in the text? Whoever says to his brother, Raka, you fool, calling names, poor communication. Does that help resolve conflicts? Of course not. So the tenor of Jesus' message here is that where we have problems, we're going to have to be willing to go and lay, lay ourselves in our case before our brother and work it out by communicating. Now, if that's true in everyday brother-to-brother relationships, how much more true is that in a marriage where we're going to have disagreements and conflicts and we have to have the spirit that says, I want to talk about this until we resolve it. Ephesians 4 and verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Now, in both of those texts, you see the urgency of it. If you remember, you have your disagreement with your brother, you leave your gift before the altar and go. Here he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. All of it is about, don't let anger fester. You talk it out. You work it out. But don't let the devil have a foothold by keeping you angry and letting that anger turn to bitterness and letting the bitterness turn into a long-term malice and hatred. That can happen in a marriage. You have seen it and I have too. The answer is communication. Now, forgiveness is going to be essential. We have to be able to let yesterday be yesterday, not keep bringing all the yesterdays and all the old fights back into the present. We're going to have to rebuild the love. We're going to have to reconnect. But in all of that, we've got to be able to talk to each other. That's the whole point. Talking and listening. There's one more thing I need to say about this. If you look down a little further in Matthew 5 and verse 33, Matthew 5 and verse 33, he says, Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. It may be the most important thing we can say about communication in a marriage, that Jesus expects honesty, complete honesty, a forthrightness, a dependability, truthfulness in a marriage. He's talking about how the Jews of his day would use oaths to get around telling the truth because they swore by this thing and not by this thing. And Jesus says, enough with all of that. Give up the oaths. Just say yes or no. Just say the truth. And that way you don't need somebody else's authority to have to lean on. You can just speak what's true. Don't we need that in a marriage? Doesn't my wife need to know that I'm telling the truth when I talk to her about money? Doesn't she need to know that I'm telling the truth when I talk to her about whether I'm attracted to somebody of the opposite sex? Doesn't she need to know if we've got a crisis in the marriage? Doesn't she need to be able to say, yes, I know that I can trust him? Are we over this? Are you okay? Are you still angry? Can we move on? 
They require truth. It seems to me that one of the really interesting parts of this topic, when I talk about truth and marriage, I've had my brethren push back. Because there is this lie that goes around in our world that if I love somebody, sometimes I withhold the truth because the truth might hurt them. And so, you know, there are things that she just doesn't need to know. She might not be able to handle it. She wouldn't understand. She wouldn't take it the right way. And I repudiate that. The idea that I need to hold my truth away from my wife and somehow that that makes me truthful, a truth teller like Jesus, she's going to have a hard time trusting me. And I'll be honest, trying to be the whole time, but I'll be honest about this too. When I have been tempted to hold back something from my wife, I might say it's about me trying to spare her feelings, but it's really about me not wanting to be fully open and being scared of the way she would act. Love, though, is not self selfish. So communicate with your wife. As you grow and change, communication is how you stay connected. It's how the spark is maintained as we work through our differences. Now, the last thing I want to say this, this afternoon about how we can prevent divorce is follow Jesus together. We've already read this passage, so I'll just put it on the board. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I love the mention of prayers there. Your prayers may not be hindered. Because what that means is our marriages affect our spiritual lives. And our spiritual lives affect our marriages. How we are doing as Christians will become how we do as husbands and wives. And how we do as husbands and wives will affect how we do as Christians. When the New Testament describes marriage as an ideal, it talks about Jesus. Jesus is the ideal for marriage. Jesus sets the tone. Jesus sets the tone in parenting. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't have a wife, but we love our wives like Christ loved the church. Jesus didn't have kids, but we raise our kids in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Jesus sets the tone. Jesus sets the standard. So as we follow Jesus, we grow closer to one another. Here is my point. My marriage will be blessed if my wife and I are growing in Christ together. It will make us stronger and better. The reason is we're not just going to be getting older. We will be growing. The fruit of the Spirit will bless my marriage. If I can learn how to live with love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, you'll like me better. My brethren will be happier with me. I'll have better friends. But that will make my wife happy. It will make my home happy as I grow in Christ. So my encouragement is, let Jesus teach you how to be more honest and how to handle your money and how to handle your relationship with the opposite sex and how to handle your anger and let Jesus work on you as you follow, as you study, as you grow. Let that be the course of your life. And you may find that your marriage gets better and better and better because you are following Jesus together. In fact, a whole lot of the principles of Christianity are marriage principles, if you apply them that way. Paul writes, you are not your own. Guess what? Married people feel that in a special way. You're not your own anymore, are you? You don't have authority over your own body. It's not about you. Jesus talks about denying yourself. Married people feel that. Hope and faith and love apply in marriages just like they do in Christian walks. But when two people are connected to Christ and connected to each other and they are growing in Christ, divorce is not really a part of that equation, is it? That doesn't really enter the mind. Because we are doing what Christ calls us to do and becoming who Christ calls us to become. And so we work together. So, I hope you understand in everything we've said, there's no way we can truly 
prevent divorce. Because divorce hinges on a whole other person that we can't control. And there will always be a part of this that is out of our hands. What I am saying is, and my determination and resolution personally, is that we can make it so that our mate never, ever, ever even wants for a moment to leave. I have resolved that I don't want my wife to ever even consider that it might be better not to be with me. I want to make her life awesome. I want her to know that the spark is still there. And I want her to know that I'm going to talk and I'm going to listen, probably more of the latter than the former. And that we're going to grow together and we're going to be together. Now, if we can do that in our home, Divorce isn't going to be a part of that. Can't control it, can't guarantee it. But I want to make it as best to my ability so that that's not the issue it has been in so many lives. Would you pray with me about that? Our God and Father, we thank you so much for the way that you revealed your heart to us and your word. We're thankful for the way that you blessed our lives by giving us the gift of marriage, the joy that it is. We're thankful for all that we have as a gift from you as we share life together with the wife of our youth. Father, we are thankful for your word that guides us in how we can best live in our marriages, and we pray for your wisdom. We pray, Father, that our marriages will truly be permanent for life so that we can grow together through the various stages of life. I pray that you'll bless each marriage that's represented here. I pray that each one of us, Father, will take seriously and personally our responsibility to show love to one another. I pray, Father, that you'll help us to be selfless like Jesus was for us so that we can truly want to serve one another and submit to one another and so bless one another and that these marriages can grow stronger and stronger as we age together. Father, I pray that our marriages can be a witness to the world that you are at work in us and I pray that as we grow and bear fruit in Christ, that those fruits will be seen, that they'll bless our homes, and that others will be drawn to you because of what they see in us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't want to close the service without offering the invitation of the Lord. So if there is someone here who is ready to make known to this group some need that you have, whether that's a need to confess sin, to have us pray with you, or a need to be baptized into Christ and have your sins washed away, if there's anything we can do for you, please come to the front as we stand and sing to encourage you.